Well, <clears throat> here I am again, folks. This is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. This is a uh, very unusual setting. We have, I'm in the state of Georgia, and we've had an ice storm. And the ice storm has knocked the power grid out, and there's no power. It just so happens God blessed me that I have gas in my house. So I have a gas fireplace behind me, burning. I've got a half a dozen candles around me. I've got a little flashlight shining on me. I've got a little flashlight here to uh, read my book with. I'm going to talk about the theological method of learning the Bible and then the practical me method of taking that doctrine, that theology you've learned, the doctrine of the Bible, and making it work just like Paul had to. This is beautiful. I love this setting. Uh, we could get chilled to the bone, but God has allowed it to where we're actually warm enough right now. Maybe between now and daylight in the morning we will be uh, need to have a jacket on. Uh, but other than that, we're in good shape. And But I can just picture Paul now by candlelight. Just by a little candlelight or a little a oil lamp that barely you could barely see by, and he's reading and he's writing this theology. He's writing these doctrines of the Bible. He's not doing it in comfort. He's doing it in very much discomfort. Yet he's doing it with a single heart and love for God, and and he's got he's encouraged himself. To be absent from the body will be present with the Lord one day. So I need to do all I can do while I'm here and while I can do it. So this is where I want to be. Uh, there's perhaps no other single word that's been more successfully twisted than the word theology. It has been twisted today into a, a biblical knot. And the guy says, well, I got a PhD and a DDD and all of this stuff, and I, I know theology. Yes, but will you get out and knock on a man's door and say, sir, if you died right now, do you know whether you'd go to heaven or not? Have you asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin, come in your heart and save your soul? If you can't do that, the, all the theology and all of the uh, knowledge you know and all the doctrine you know, you could die and go to hell with a head full of theology and a head full of doctrine. It's what you do with it is what counts. Have you got it in your heart? If you got it in your heart, it's got to come out. You can't just keep it there. You blow up. You've got to get it out. So, in the minds of millions, doctrine involves the following concept. It's uh, the silly and useless practice of arguing in the spirit traditions of medieval. That's not what doctrine is, but that is today the thought about doctrine. I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to do like the monks used to do. I'm going to get so much knowledge that I can debate other monks. That we can sit around and debate each other for half of the day or whatever. And that's how we're going to do it. Well, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. That's not why you learn the theology. That's not why you learn doctrine. The reason you learn it is so that you can get out and expound it to others. Now. Let's see, working by candlelight. All right, so things is, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Do you think you could answer that? These are questions you have. People ask me, I say, uh, I have got a doctorate. I got a doctorate in, in Bible. And people ask you foolish questions. They'll say, well, where did Lot get his wife? Well, I can answer that. 
But rather than to answer that trivial question, I would like to say, where did you get your salvation? Where did you get the salvation that you have? You have salvation. It's not important where Lot got his wife. What is important is knowing Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, to take away our sins. And he went through that, all of that. Why, do you think it's a problem to have a little ice stone and to have to get on here and work a little by candlelight? Just imagine, Jesus went through his life by candlelight. Everything that he did at night was done by candlelight. A light, some kind of lantern and it was not like we have today and so uh, this was another question that we heard we learned when we was in school that uh, people would ask can God make a stone so heavy he can't lift it <laughs> what a conundrum what foolishness that is we don't need to be looking at that Can, can God put an immovable post up and then not be able to move it himself? Questions people ask you that want to try to baffle you and that would baffle their own self. I mean, they can't even answer that question. Why ask a question you can't answer your own self? Doctrine divides whereas love unites. So be careful how educated you get that you're not a divider but that you're a uniter. One cannot mix doctrine with soul winning. Now, I, I, in a big sense of the word, you can't mix doctrine with soul winning, but it is the doctrine that you're preaching, that Jesus Christ going to the cross. That's what soul winning is. And so, that's what you have. Ah, uh, Sometimes people will say, well, Doctrine's dull and impractical. No, it isn't. Doctrine is like starlight, and it's practical. When you're out at night, just the stars that are out give you enough light to be practical enough so that you can walk in that light without stumbling. After you're in the dark for a while, those lights become quite bright to you from the stars. That's what they were for. They have the night lights. And the longer you're in the dark, the better you can see. And so, these are practical. Uh, you say, well, doctrine is over the head of most people. It doesn't have to be. It's according to how you present it. You can know all the doctrines in the Bible and know how to present them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, all the way through, Peter, James, John, they all are doctrinal Bibles, doctrinal words, but they were all written so that anybody, even a six-year-old, can understand what they say. And that's all doctrine. But they can say that. So what's the question? Why learn a lot of doctrine? Why don't we just live up to the light we have? Well, that's good too. Before, when I got saved November 5th, 1972, at 3 o'clock in the morning. I didn't know one thing about doctrine. Nothing. The only doctrine I knew that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, and when I asked him to forgive me of my sin, he did. He came into my heart, he saved my soul, I never swore another cuss word, never drank another drink, never did another thing after that. That was it. And now I'm here, uh, 40 something years later, <laughs> in a warm house when it's de de degrees outside, it's about 16, 18 degrees. I'm in a warm house by candlelight and a flashlight doing an a excerpt. So the key goal is to let the Bible master us, not us master the Bible. If you think you're a master of the Bible, you're fooling yourself. You are fooling yourself because you're not mastering the Bible. The Bible was master you. 
and not spend uh, our energy in trying to master the Bible. Let the Bible master us. Just read the simple little things. For God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. That's something, isn't it? In the answer to these charges, one could say that they are far moved from the truth as the baby is in Bethlehem. It's from uh, each argument. If you're an arguer, you're not a person properly using doctrine. If somebody wants to argue a doctrine with you, you need to say, let's go back and see why we're talking about that doctrine. Why are we talking about that doctrine? Why are we talking about that? They want to talk about the flood. Okay. Let's talk about the flood. Why did the flood come? Because of the evilness of man upon the earth. God flooded the earth and killed all but... Uh, uh, Noah, Ham, Shem, Japheth, and uh, the, the women. And so God killed them all. What, why? Well, all right. If that's the case, you seem to have an answer for that, Brother Pete. Uh, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, God took Lot and his wife and, and two girls out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he destroyed the whole place. That's simple. It's written that way. That's the way it's written. It exactly says exactly what happened, and that's what happened. It's not a debate. It's not anything. It's, well, what did God do with it? He said that he destroyed it into rubble and put it down. It's under the, the Dead Sea. And so we know that. And say, well, you come on up. Well, what about the Tower of Babel? Where God destroyed, he put the, the people all spoke the same language. That's a doctrine. And after the Tower of Babel, God came down and confused their language. That's another doctrine of the Bible. But those, those aren't argumentative points. Those are facts. Don't make things that are facts into something to talk about, discuss, and argue about. You can discuss it, but don't argue about it. Just get all of it in. Get all your ducks in a row, and then then they'll swim properly. You can't mix some things together, and you can mix some things together. Most things in the Bible can be mixed as uh, yes and no. Yes and no. My boy used to all the time say when he was younger, he had one of these things that had a yin and a yang on it. That was good and evil. Well, that's the way the Bible is. The Bible's a story of good and evil. You don't need to be a theologian to be able to do the Bible. Did you know that Paul the one that wrote to theology that you and I are studying, the majority of it in the New Testament, was a soul winner, door to door, door knocker. That he walked door to door and he knocked. And the greatest soul winner of his time he was, of all time. And on top of that, he was the greatest theologian that ever walked on two feet. All of the things that he wrote in the New Testament are 13 books of theology. The theo is God. And the ology is uh, the story. Theo is God. So he, he wrote Godology. That's what he wrote. Godology. The ology of God. Theology. 
greatest soul winner that ever lived. And listen, he went with tears and he pleaded with people. You need to be saved or you die and go to hell forever. In Acts 20, 20, 21, 26, he also wrote some 50% of the New Testament, including that most profound of all doctrinal books, the Epistle of Romans. How to live. How to live a Christian life, the book of Romans. How do we live a Christian life? by getting into the Word, by learning what the Word says, and then we need to learn, what is a Christian life? That's acting Christ-like. If you act Christ-like, that's a Christian life. Do you let things keep you from doing what you do? I'm not going to let this ice storm and the fact we don't have any power stop me from doing what God would have me do. I'm going to improvise, which that's what I'm doing. There'll be a lot of people say, well, I wouldn't watch that. Look at that. It's all blurred out and everything. But I'm going to tell you what, this is what candlelight looks like. <laughs> I'm already old and ugly. But do you remember lamps, kerosene lamps? I do. Do you remember living in a house with lamps? I do. When I was a kid, I remember living with lamps. I remember when we had lamps and they had to live with them and use them. You know that doctrine will put fire in your heart, will put a song in your heart. If you will heed the tremendous words of the Bible, if you'll heed them, uh, I, can't, I can't tell you enough, the words are like thunder. The action of the words is like lightning. You can be a thunder and lightning storm wherever you are. You can speak gently out the words of God and they'll become like thunder. A person goes home and goes to bed at night and that thunder in his head, that, what that man said. And then the lightning strikes. He says, you know what? Uh, that man said, God said he would forgive me of my sin and come in my heart and save my soul if I asked him. And they can use that. They can use that. And they said one to another when Jesus was in the midst and when Paul was in the midst did not our hearts burn within us while this man was here? See, when Jesus came on the scene the people's hearts burned and when Paul who was carrying Jesus in him came on the scene their hearts burned. Luke 24, 32. <coughs> Speak to yourselves in signs and hymns. Wow. Spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 19. <coughs> Do you know you're never alone? If you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, you are never alone. He is with you continually, always. And you're never alone. And you need to um, and make a note of that. That you can sing in melody. You can be out in the woods. You could be lost. Do you know what you do if you catch on fire? You stop, you drop, and you roll. Say you got some fluid or something on you and you call on fire. Stop, drop, and roll. What do you do when you get lost? You stand still. Collect your mind. Think about it. 
Is it nighttime? If it is, pick a star out and walk toward that star. And don't let that star out of sight. Keep it in line. Keep it. Walk a straight line toward that star. You'll walk out of where you are. What happens if you quit thinking sensibly? You'll start running. You'll get frightened. You'll run in circles. You'll tear your clothes off. You'll cry and get sick. I've been there and did it. <laughs> I was about eight years old. Got lost in a patch of woods. Ran. Got to cry and got scared. Instead of stopping and listening. Stop. Look. Listen. Think about it. You got where you are to get lost. How did you get where you are? Can you remember anything you passed coming in? And so, this is the thing. We need to think about things. This is the way the Bible is. It's a book you can get lost in if you don't pay attention. The trail you get going into the Bible so that you can tell others about it is a well-marked trail. And you need to go according to the markings. Speak to yourselves in Psalms and Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Revelations one and three. What time is at hand? The time is at hand for Christians, Christ-like people, that's what Christians are, to get on the ball and start winning some people to the Lord. Start working in the necessity of getting things done that need to be done and doing what they need to do. And don't let anything stop you. How long did I meditate on setting up this candlelight and getting this so that I could go ahead and do this tonight? I had planned on doing some excerpts tonight. And then we got hit with this ice storm and everything. Did that change my plans? Not one bit. It caused me to go to work and change the surroundings around me and get some candlelight going and get some, some fire going in the fireplace and get some, some uh, uh, I actually have gas in my house. I have out on the burners on the stove, I've got two great big pots of water with lids on them. I got them down on low and they're hot and they're keeping the area from pipes from freezing out there. They're keeping the area out there warm enough so it won't freeze thinking ahead. This is what the Bible does. The Bible thinks for you, but if you don't know the Bible, how are you supposed to relate it to anybody? You've got to relate it to people. Behold, he said, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy of the book of Revelation. Keeping what it says in our heart and in our life. God taught us things. We, we all, I think everybody is pretty much from when they're little, know that it would be wrong to kill somebody. Knows that when you tell a lie, it was wrong to tell the lie. Knows that when you take something that doesn't belong to you, that's called stealing, and it's not right. And and we know these things, so therefore, it we simply follow those things without being causing us great grief or any problem. Well, that's the way the Bible is. It's not supposed to cause us grief or problem. It's supposed to separate us from the things of the world, the way of the world. At that time, Jesus answered and said, 
I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast did these things from the wise, hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. <laughs> you say a baby knows that? Hey, I know some. Hey, do you know that I, I was in the children's church about seven years? I had children. And, and I tell you what, those children could baffle a grown man with their knowledge of the Bible and their belief because they believed like a child was supposed to believe. They read it and they believed what they read. A grown-up reads it and he says, I don't know if I can figure that out or not. You ain't supposed to figure it out. You're supposed to believe what it says. It's figured itself out already. It's telling you what's already figured out. You don't have to figure on it. You just go ahead and accept it. Like a child does. Things from the wise and the prudent has revealed them unto babes. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is that so hard to understand? If you're laboring and heavy laden in the world and you're going the way of the devil and you're going to die and end up going to hell, is it so hard to understand that Jesus said, Come unto me, and I'll give you rest? The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus said, I'm your shepherd. If you'll come to me, I'll be your shepherd. You don't have to want. I'll make you lay down the green pastures. Hey, you don't have to worry about being thirsty. I, I'll put you by the, the springs of living water. And, and so he, he'll keep you from the, the things of the world. Take my yoke upon you, he said, and learn of me. What makes the yoke light when you learn of him and let him carry it? I always look at it this way. I look at it this way. I'm five feet and four inches, and Jesus is six feet and two inches. If I'm in a yoke with him, and he's standing tall, and he's got that double yoke on his shoulder, what do I have to do? I can just walk in the shadow of this side of it because he's carrying the whole thing because I ain't tall enough to get under it and put, carry no load. So if you let him carry the load and you just follow along with him, his yoke is easy. And your burden will be light. He'll carry it for you. Why be heavy laden? He said, For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. My friend, when you take and talk about the soul, do you know what the rest of the soul is? We can have it here on earth, but the rest of the souls, we're going, our soul is going to go. The second we draw our last breath, our soul is going to be with the Father in heaven. And that's what's going to live with God forever. Your soul is going to live with God forever. He'll join you back up with a body later on, but the soul's what counts. For my yoke is easier, my burden light. Matthew eleven twenty five. Let me tell you something about that. The soul of a lost man is going to live forever too. But it's going to live forever in hell, in fire, in brimstone. Do you remember the rich man? who wouldn't accept Jesus. Lazarus was laid at his gate full of souls. The Bible said the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes and he was in torment and he seeth Abraham afar off. I tell you what, one of the torments of hell is going to be that they can look out of there and see those in heaven. But those in heaven aren't going to be able to look out and see those in hell going to be a one-way trip for them. They can look and see all the good that we have, and they're going to be in torment. Yet, in heaven there is not one speck, not one drop of sweat, not one speck of what is evil on this earth. Not a speck. Not a jot. Not a tittle. Nothing. It's total bliss. God never 
ever, never, ever. God and, and the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ never, ever had a sin. Not one. Not one sin was ever laid on them. Not one. That was something mankind did, the devil did. So therefore, you got sinless. When you get to heaven, you have sinless perfection. If we would look today at the sinless logic of, of the world today, the sinful logic of the world today, sinful logic, everything is logically and sinful of the world today, and it's, it's really illogical because it's not in con the Bible. Well, our time's come and gone. We'll see you next time. It's Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. Bye-bye.